For long years, the Valar dwelt in the light of Aman, the Blessed Realm. The two trees were at this time restricted behind the mountains of the Pelori. Laurelin and Telperion shone a supernatural, glorious light that spread over all of the lands of Valinor. The walls of the world, Arome's forests, Yavanna's pastures, the Tenequetil, the hollowed mountain of Manwe and Barda, the gardens of Lorien, the halls of Nandos, the halls of Niena, all of these places were in the west, in a paradise away from the majority of the lands of Arda, the world that is. Orome and Yavanna traveled from Valinor and visited the lands of Middle-earth as they were in twilight. Yavanna, the Valar of nature, and Orome, the huntsman of the Valar, had the most interest in protecting the wide lands of Arda beyond Valinor. Orome, as his name suggests, loved to hunt servants of Melkor in the wide lands. Yavanna observed the hibernation that the plants and animals of the land were in as the world lay in shadow. Yavanna desired most the protection of that which she had made. It was then discovered that from the ancient fortress of Atumno in the far north, Melkor ruled a vast kingdom as the Dark Lord on his dark throne. Melkor's domain contained all of Middle-earth and the outer lands to the east of Valinor. The woods were haunted with shapes of dread and spirits of terror. The mightiest of these great demons were the Balrogs, or the Valaraukar, whose leader was Gothmog, the Lord of Balrogs, who would ever after be one of the greatest foes of the elves in the First Age. It is also likely that Tolkien's version of vampires stalked the wilds at this time. Vampires were mysterious bat-like creatures in the service of Morgoth and Sauron. The only vampire named in the Legendarium is Thuringwithil, the Lady of Dark Shadows and Sauron's servant in the First Age. Sauron himself took on the form of a vampire on one occasion to escape the Hound of the Valar, Huan, and the elven princess Luthien of Doriath in the First Age. Melkor's realm spread ever eastward and southward and covered the entire world, beyond Valinor. Melkor made the foundations of a new fortress that would be his chief stronghold in the wars of the First Age. This fortress was among what would become the Thangorodrim, the Iron Mountains, in the far north of Beleriand the lands west of the Arid Luin, or the Blue Mountains. To the north of Beleriand, the stronghold of Angband was made. Angband translates to the Hells of Iron. To this stronghold, Melkor entrusted Gorthar the Cruel. Gorthar was also known as Sauron, the Lieutenant of Melkor, who was corrupted into his service and became the mightiest of the spirits that followed the first Dark Lord on his ruinous path down into the Void. Sauron, however, would later come to despise Melkor in secret, for Sauron was once Myron, the Maya of order and perfection. Sauron saw Melkor as too chaotic of a dark lord for his own personal taste, and Sauron wanted to be worshipped and revered as a great god of the earth to put things as he willed them. Sauron, for this time, remained faithful to Melkor out of fear of his master. It is also likely that at this time, Sauron saw much to gain from his service to Melkor that he later would lose faith in. Yavanna and Arome returned to Valinor, and Yavanna went before the Valar and said, Be sure of this, the hour approaches, and within this age our hope shall be revealed, and the children shall awake. Shall we then leave the lands of their dwelling desolate and full of evil? Shall they walk in darkness while we have light? Shall they call Melkor Lord while Manwe sits upon Tenequetil? Tolgas, the champion of the Valar, was of course eager to destroy Melkor. Mandos is the doomsman of the Valar, and at the bidding of Manwe appointed Varda as the Vala tasked with service to the firstborn children of Iluvatar. The stars Varda made would be the sign of their awakening. Varda took silver dews from Telperion and made new stars. Varda was ever after worshipped as Elbereth, the queen of the stars. As the stars were made, the children of the earth rose by Kuivenen, the water of awakening. The firstborn beheld first the light of the stars and revered them ever after. Kuivenen, in the later days of Middle-earth, became inaccessible. There is no returning to that land. Apart from the stars, the elves held most dear the running of water. Long the elves dwelt and they began to make their own language and named what they saw. They named themselves the Quendi, those that speak with voices. Although Yovana and Orome roamed the wide lands of Arda, Melkor was the one who discovered the elves first. Melkor sent shadows and evil spirits to stalk the Quendi and invoked fear and distress among their people. If any of the elves strayed too far away from the group, 
they would vanish, never to be seen again. The Quendi began to rumor that the hunter had caught them. In the most ancient songs of the elves, tales are told of shadowy shapes that wandered near Cuivenen and a dark rider who took their people and destroyed them. How would the Valar discover them and deliver them from the darkness of Melkor? Orome the Huntsman rode east, and by chance went along the Sea of Helkar near the Orokarni, the mountains of the east. These red mountains eventually became the dwellings of the dwarves, and in the first age, four clans of the dwarves lived in these mountains. Orome continued his journey, and he looked upon the elves for the first time, and he was filled with a familiar yet alien feeling. Orome saw that they were more beautiful than he imagined, yet they looked familiar also. The Valar tried to imitate the forms of the children of Iluvatar in the forms that they took on themselves. The firstborn were stronger and greater in the beginning than at any other time in the history of Arda. As the ages drew on, their glory diminished. Their beauty and majesty now lives only in the west, apart from the world. Orome named the Quendi the Eldar, the people of the stars. Many Quendi, however, were afraid of him, for when Nahar, his horse, neighed, some of them hid and fled. The noblest of the elves came to love Orome and knew him to be a unique being, not of the darkness they feared and of no threat to them. Little is known of the elves that were ensnared by Melkor. The Quendi that went to Atumno were imprisoned there and were slowly enslaved, tortured, and mutilated into becoming the race of the orcs, made in mockery of the elves. Melkor, of his own might, had not the power to create life of his own, for he had not the flame imperishable which was within Eru Iluvatar, the god of the world. Melkor could, however, corrupt life and turn beings invoked with the flame imperishable into beings of terror and dread, mockeries of their former forms. The orcs, deep in their minds and hearts, hated the master they served, but served him out of fear and not love. This is why when Sauron was thrown down at the destruction of the ring at the end of the Third Age, the orcs went mad and fled instead of continuing to fight. These orcs never knew what freedom truly felt like. Orcs bred from the elves were likely immortal, while those bred from men in the future were likely not. Orcs are not very much described in the works of Tolkien, at least in regards to their creation. However, Melkor cannot take away the gift of the firstborn, which is immortality, neither can he take away the gift of men, which is death, to leave the world. The gifts of Iluvatar would persist even among the corrupted forms of the orcs. Orome brought news of the Eldar to Valinor. The Valar had immense and lengthy debates over what to do to guard the Quendi from Melkor. Manwe is the king of the Valar and the most akin to Iluvatar and knows most his thoughts. Manwe sought the counsel of Iluvatar. It was then decided by Manwe to deliver the Quendi from Melkor by making war upon Atumno and Angband. Tolkas was joyful. Ale, the maker and craftsman of the Valar, was distraught as he knew the stone, the earth, and his domain and all of his labors would be immensely damaged from this war. Melkor's name means he who arises in might. The Valar were about to arise in might against him. The war for the sake of the elves is only spoken of in legend, as no being bore witness to these apart from the Valar themselves. The elves from Cuivenen felt the tumults of the earth and saw far off great lights in the sky as if a great battle was taking place. The great sea grew wide and deep and separated Amman from Middle Earth. The Helkarakse, the icy wastes in the north that connected Amman to Middle Earth, were also formed in this time. Beleriand, as it was later known, was shaped from these battles in the northwest of the world. The gates of Atumno were broken, and Melkor hid in the deepest pit. Tolkas came forth and wrestled with him, and cast his face into the dust. Melkor was bound with the chain on Gynor that Aule had crafted, and the Dark Lord was led to Valinor in chains. The Valar, however, did not purify his deep underground fortresses, and much evil still lingered there. Most importantly of all, Sauron escaped and could not be found. Melkor sued for pardon at the Ring of Doom, but he was denied and cast into prison. He abode for three ages long, or three thousand years in our reckoning, in the halls of Mandos, in a prison. Melkor never forgot that this war that led to his defeat was fought for the sake of the elves, the firstborn children of Arda, and Melkor would hate them forever more than any others for all of the ages of the world. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to leave a like down below. And the next video I'll do on the Silmarillion will be of the coming of the elves into the west and their dwellings in Valinor and their divisions. So, I hope you'll stay tuned for that as it leads to a lot of the history of the elves and their origins. See you next time.